Live from Lincoln Center, another in the Emmy Award winning series coming to you from Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. This is Martin Bookspan. This evening, we join the New York Philharmonic for a gala opening night concert, which marks the beginning of the orchestra's 145th season. Zubin Mehta, music director of the New York Philharmonic, conducts the program. Violinist Yitzhak Perlman is the featured soloist. This concert is being broadcast live from Avery Fisher Hall. And now, backstage, here is our host, Patrick Watson. Welcome backstage. It's Tuesday, September the 16th. We're live from New York City, where it's beginning to feel outside a little bit like autumn, and inside this building they've known for some time that summer is over, as they scurry around to spruce the place up and get the contracts let, get the rehearsals underway. Brand new television cameras, by the way, whose images you'll be seeing shortly as the concert gets underway, all in honor, in a way, of this night, the season opener. And conductor Zubin Mehta has chosen to kick off the 86th season by inviting his friend, violinist Itzhak Perlman, to give us a display of some violin pyrotechnics and then the orchestra to do one of the great lush items of the symphony uh, repertoire. Mr. Perlman will lead off with Ravel's uh, Gypsy Serenade, and it's a piece of real violin gymnastics. Watch for his fingers to leave his hand. And then move on to a moody, intense uh, minor key poem by Chausson. And finally, another piece of pyrotechnics, a fantasy based on Bizet's Carmen, which is just a lot of musical fun. I'll be talking to Mr. Perlman and Mr. Maida here at the intermission. And then in the second half, Mr. Maida brings on the full orchestra, 87 musicians, 33 violins, a dozen cellos, 10 basses, double woodwinds, brass, to give him the texture and the depth he needs for Tchaikovsky's Fifth, one of Mr. Maida's favorites. I see that conductor Maida and our guest soloist, our guest soloist is ready to go on stage, so let's go out to the hall and I'll rejoin you here at the intermission. And the first work on our program is the Rhapsody for Violin and Orchestra Tsigan by Maurice Ravel. Its first performance took place in the United States in December of 1924 by the Dutch violinist André Pola, who studied Tsigan with Ravel, and Pola, describing the work, said, Ravel's idea was to represent a gypsy serenading with all the extravagances of his fiery temperament and all the good and bad taste at his command, some real or imaginary beauty. Nearly the full Opening third of Ravel's Tsigan is an extended cadenza for the solo violin. And then when the orchestra finally does come in, it's with a flourish of harp and a commanding gypsy theme takes over and rules the remainder of the piece. Yitzhak Perlman, our violin soloist, Zubin Mehta conducting the New York Philharmonic in Tsigan by Maurice Ravel.
Thank you. 
live from Lincoln Center, this has been Sigan, a concert rhapsody for violin and orchestra by Maurice Ravel, played by Yitzhak Perlman with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Zubin Mehta. The opening work on this gala opening concert of the 1986-87 season by the New York Philharmonic. Ravel composed the Tsigan for the Hungarian violinist Jeli Daranyi, who had a phenomenal technique. And Ravel posed before Daranyi all manner of technical challenges. When she learned the piece, within a couple of weeks, Ravel is supposed to have said to her, had I known it was this easy for you, I'd have, I'd have made it even more difficult to play. And Daranyi it was, incidentally, who said that in a dream, the spirit of Robert Schumann came to her in the 1920s and told her where to find the manuscript of his supposedly long-lost violin concerto. Daranyi followed the instructions in the dream and, in fact, came up with the Schumann violin concerto. She it was who played it extensively in Europe in the 1930s. It was then taken up by Yehudi Menuhin, and as a matter of fact, there was a recording that Menuhin made of the Schumann Concerto with the New York Philharmonic and John Barbaroli conducting in the later 1930s. The next music that we'll hear on the program brings yet again another work for violin and orchestra. As a matter of fact, three violin and orchestra works make up the first portion of our program tonight. The next score, the poetic and one might again say the rhapsodic, poem by Ernest Chanson, the French composer who was born in 1855 and died tragically in a bicycling accident in 1899 at the age of 44. The Chanson poem is in one continuous movement. It is reflective, rhapsodic, poetic, and rises to several passionate and intense climaxes. Yitzhak Perlman, with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Zubin Mehta, performs the poem for violin and orchestra by Ernest Chausson.
The Poem for Violin and Orchestra by Ernest Chausson. Brought to you live from Lincoln Center, from the stage of Avery Fisher Hall, Yitzhak Perlman, violin soloist with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Zubin Mehta. The next music we'll have is the concert fantasy on motifs from Bizet's opera Carmen for violin and orchestra by the Spanish-born violin virtuoso Pablo de Sarasate. And there are five familiar excerpts from Bizet's Carmen that are put through the virtuosic ringer in this blazing display of violin fireworks composed by one of the great violin virtuosos in history, Sarasate. Yitzhak Perlman, Zubin Mehta, the New York Philharmonic.
Concert Fantasy on Motifs from Bizet's opera Carmen for violin and orchestra by Pablo de Sarasate. Has been played by Yitzhak Perlman with Zubin Mehta conducting the New York Philharmonic. Concert Paraphrases and Metamorphoses of operatic themes were a favorite pastime of 19th century composers. The most famous of them, of course, is the series that Franz Liszt composed for piano solo. Paraphrases on many operas of the Italian bel canto repertory and also some Verdi operas, which were contemporary with Liszt. Bizet's Carmen, of course, as filtered through the violinistic imagination of Pablo de Sarasate, affording a field day for a violin virtuoso. And what a virtuoso we have on hand, Yitzhak Perlman. The fantasy on Bizet's Carmen, the third of three works for a violin and orchestra that have made up the first half of today's live from Lincoln Center telecast. The program began with Ravel's Cigan, continued with Chausson's Poem, and now this first half concluded with Sarasate's Concert Fantasy on Bizet's Carmen. And incidentally, nearer our own time, there is another fantasy on Bizet's Carmen for violin and orchestra, composed by Franz Waxman. And that work has been performed by, among others, Yasha Heifetz and Isaac Stern. But the Sarasate remains paramount in the affections of soloists and audiences. And so we come to the midpoint of this performance, coming to you live from Lincoln Center, from the stage of Avery Fisher Hall at New York City's Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts.
In the second part of the program, Zubin Mehta will return to conduct the New York Philharmonic in the Symphony No. 5 in E minor, Opus 64, by Tchaikovsky. The past few months have been extraordinarily busy ones for both Zubin Mehta and Yitzhak Perlman, and as a matter of fact, the two of them have collaborated in the past several weeks in performances with the touring Israel Philharmonic Orchestra in various cities throughout the United States and also in a concert performance by the Israel Philharmonic at Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Perlman at Tanglewood made a scheduled appearance playing the Brahms Concerto with Seiji Ozawa and the Boston Symphony and the next night an unscheduled and impromptu performance of the Bruch Concerto with Mr. Mehta and the Israel Philharmonic. And now, let's once again go backstage to our host, Patrick Watson. A minute ago, when you said to, we're on, when you said to him, don't do that, what did he do that he shouldn't have done? I didn't do anything. I just oh, made a pun. Uh, he's the president of the Pan-American Conference. <laughs> I mean, that's no, no, the last excuse one me. <laughs> You're the one. No, I didn't do anything. He, he won't stop. <laughs> Look, I was so I told seriously, him to behave himself on Maestro, television. I was seriously rehearsing <clears throat> with you, and you start with this. Well, never mind. Gentlemen. Well, Gentlemen. the floor is yours. I'm going to sit back, concentrate, it's like think the, of Tchaikovsky. They tell me that uh, Zubin's about to go on sabbatical at the turn of the year. How can a musician go You're on a sabbatical? On sabbatical? If you went on a sabbatical, wouldn't your fingers turn? That doesn't mean we are going to play fall. less. No, for, for me, a sabbatical is a, as a weekend, you know, the Sabbath, you yes. know, that's a sabbatical, you know, every week I have a sabbatical. But what about this? You're going on a sabbatical, but you're going to conduct as much as ever. What are you going to do? Well, it's almost biblical. You know, in the Bible it says seven times seven, and the last year, the 50th year, one has to take off. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm just taking off from New York. Because not to get serious, eight years of conducting in New York with the New York Philharmonic, going on tour with them and making the recordings and planning. This takes a toll. One needs a little breather from New York in the, in the positive sense. So what is your breather going to consist of? First of all, I'm going to take about three months off. And do nothing? Completely nothing. His fingers will turn stiff. I His mean, baton will get My long distance phone call. <laughs> yeah, that, go that's going to be a big, big <laughs> distance long go. Uh, no, I'm going to do opera. Where? I'll do a new production of uh, Otello in Vienna with Zeffirelli and my friend Placido. And uh, you have doing... a small part for me, or or is that out? We can always manipulate that. Is in that, Otello, is... there's lots. Are of... there any jailers in Otello? No, <laughs> there's a lot of fencing in the first Fen act. Well, that's me. That's me. That's <laughs> and there's some puns in the second act, which you would be very happy with. What, is this going to be a film? You said Zeffirelli. No, no, no. Zeffirelli stages opera also. Yes, uh, I was hoping it would be another one. <coughs> it's at the Vienna Opera. And uh, at the end of the year, operatically speaking, I'm doing a new Tristan in Los Angeles with Jonathan Miller as the regisseur and David Hockney. And I'm looking forward to that very much. How long will you be away? Will this be a whole year off? A whole, the whole calendar year. Yeah. Then, of course, I'm a lot with the Israel Philharmonic. We celebrate our 50th anniversary in December. The Israel Philharmonic, that is. Then Rubinstein's 100th anniversary in January. Then we go on a tour of South America with the New York Philharmonic so that I don't lose touch with them the whole year. Then I have a European. What, do you want me to go on? No, not no. really. I was just going to go on. Well, ask I Itzhak. Thank God for anniversary. I was just going to ask Itzhak if you understand what he means about having to get away from New York. Do you ever feel that? Well, I'll tell you, I'm uh, not in the position. You misunderstood me already. All right. All right. Yes, I can see a big misquote here. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to it. Uh, <laughs> well, getting uh, away from the what? The intensity of New York. No, but the thing you see, the thing is that I do not have the kind of intensity that Zubin has. You know, because he has to work with the same group. You know, and really, and the way Zubin works with the group, it's not just like you come in, you rehearse, and you go home. You know, he works constantly on all sides, on all fronts. With me, you know, I just live here, you know, and occasionally I play here. And it's, for me, I, I love to play in New York because for me, that's like uh, I play here and then I go home, and I don't have to travel, you know. So for me, uh, staying in New York is not a problem at all. It's uh, you know because it's a different kind of a, 
career. It's a different kind, you know. A soloist has something else, and a conductor has much more of a commitment, a time commitment. Will there really be a spiritual refreshment for you by working with yes, these other? That is the and... main reason. That is the main reason because we at the Philharmonic in New York. Do you realize, or does anybody realize, what this orchestra goes through from the middle of September, just one week off for Christmas, until the middle of May? Every week, we play new programs. And in Carnegie Hall, or in our own hall here, at Avery Fisher, we have the visiting orchestras that come in and play their parade pieces. And we play world premieres, we play not, you know, experimental music sometimes. We, we foray into all sorts of uh, areas. <clears throat> when we go on tour, we also take our parade pieces. But we are directly playing against or opposite or in friendly competition to the world's greatest orchestras here. And this, after eight years of programming, one needs a little bit of a respite. Speaking of respite, I'm astounded that you two guys can come off after a first half like that, which was a... Well, no, it for me, like it was sheer pleasure. I stand and enjoy. He's the one who really did all this. No, no, no really, I it. was it. just terrific. I enjoyed it. Listen, to play with you, you know, this is going to be this He's trying to get a little mushy uh, here. Is it, would you, like, to play with would you two so guys so like me to be alone? <laughs> it is, you know. No, he's, you know... Because we never play together, ever, anywhere. As I was saying, you know, about you the other day, and I said, to play with you is like to play with nobody. I don't know there's somebody behind me. You know, it all fits like a glove, you know. I don't need to worry. When you finish and come off like that, do you feel exhilarated, flat? What's the, what's the mood? I feel like talking, can't you tell? <laughs> no, you didn't say anything. You promised me a story. He didn't Where say enough it? on stage. I didn't say anything. <laughs> come back to the question, though. Is there, uh, is there a sense of letdown after... Uh, a tremendous response from the audience and a performance that you must have felt pretty good about. Thank God there isn't, for me anyway, because uh, I always have another performance to look towards. And uh, We're going to record all this that's the right. weekend. Same. Yes. Plus more stuff. Plus more works. Yeah. Not with an audience. In a studio? Yeah, studio. In a studio. More fun or less fun? Different. It's different. There is a uh, there is a quality that you have to try and get in the studio as though there is an audience. You, you, I, I wish there was some some such of an adrenaline shot for musicians. You know, you stick a needle there and you feel like there are ten thousand people watching you and you really have it flowing. And that you have to do in a recording. Sometimes in the first half an hour, one feels one has it, and then Thanks. suddenly not. Thank you, gentlemen. Good Thank luck you. with the recording. That's it. Yeah, Just eat us. We'll be back for the second half of this gala New York Philharmonic opening night right after this short pause. This program is made possible by a grant from Exxon. Exxon, quality you can count on in the performing arts. This program is also made possible by grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Saturday evenings at 8 o'clock, we bring you The Thistle and Shamrock, a program which features the traditional music of Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Fiona Ritchie is your host for a program that leads you on a musical journey through these Celtic lands. Don't miss The Thistle and Shamrock tomorrow evening at about 9 o'clock, one hour later than usual, on these subscriber-supported stations. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a subscriber to KUSC, we invite you to call our toll-free telephone number. The number is 1-800-824-7888, and do ask for operator 928. These are the subscriber-supported arts and information stations of the University of Southern California. At 91.5 FM, you're tuned to KUSC Los Angeles. At 88.7 FM to KSCA Santa Barbara. Or at 91.1 FM, you're tuned to KCPB Thousand Oaks. Tonight at 11 o'clock, International Festival. At 12, Gene Parrish is your host for Music Through the Night. This is live from Lincoln Center, the opening program in our 1986-1987 season, and it is the gala opening concert of the 86-87 season of the New York Philharmonic. The concert is coming to you from the stage of Avery Fisher Hall, 
in New York City. And now let's go backstage once again to our host, Patrick Watson. Itzhak Perlman's presence on the program tonight reminded some of the staff of an intermission feature that was taped with Mr. Perlman in 1982, which everyone who saw remembers with tremendous affection. It showed a side of the great artist that you very seldom see. He went across to the collegiate school, a prep school just a few blocks from here, and spent an hour or so with students fielding questions, any questions at all. And if anyone expected that exchange to be stuffy, academic, and deferential, they were in for a surprise. The results were charming, and we're delighted to have an excuse to show them to you again. So, first victim. Yes. What do you think would have happened if when you first starting out, instead of having a violin put in your hands, you had, say, a trumpet or an oboe, would you have achieved the same level, do you think? Or do you think we're just made to be a violinist? I don't a... know. I don't really know. In Israel, there's never a chance that anybody put an oboe in your mouth. Are you kidding? <laughs> Can you imagine the Jewish mother comes to us and says, oh dear, here is an oboe, play the oboe. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and... It, uh, uh, even worth a trumpet, you know, oboe maybe, but a trumpet! <laughs> do, you think, do you think, so bad examples, but do you think that you, you are, couldn't be anything but a violinist and... Well, okay, all right. Or some great trumpet player, if by, it was a, an accident that he was a trumpet player instead of a violinist? Well, okay, look, musically speaking, I could probably be a fairly good musician on, on any instrument, if I could play it, if I, had, if I had the talent to play the instrument, there has got to be a dual talent there. There's got to be a real musical understanding and a musical mind, as well as real capability. If I don't have good lips, I, I won't be able to play the trumpet and, and do whatever I want to do musically. So, uh, so it really is hard to, uh, to really say if I, were, if I was given another instrument, if I would be good. You know, we would have to see if I have a talent for it, for the actual physical playing of it. Yes. How do you feel about the commercialism in the arts these days? And do you think that it leads to any kinds of sacrifice in artistic quality? Okay. Commercialism in the arts. Uh, can you be more specific? Okay. Well, <laughs> things like fur coats and American Express cars and then going... <laughs> I don't know the fur coat, I'm sorry. Fitting in that advertising for those and going outside of the arts to find publicity. And then going beyond that into, there are a lot of publicity on how certain artists seem to give their most when they're going to be on television because that has the wider audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't own a fur coat. <laughs> And I do not give my most for television only. <laughs> no, I tell you, uh, I feel that television has been phenomenal for the arts. Absolutely phenomenal. That it has brought the arts to so many millions of people that would otherwise not uh, see, not know the experience. You're talking about opera, you're talking about ballet, you're talking about concerts. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I think that in, the, in the, 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 the last five years and in the next five years will be probably called a sort of like a golden age in, in the arts in the United States. And I think that's basically because of television. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, commercials, uh, you may have seen my commercial on Mercury Express. <laughs> um, I did play Beethoven there, and uh, so as a result, uh, I have to now play in Kalamazoo because I mentioned that I brought Beethoven to Kalamazoo. So the next day they called me up and said, so when is he coming? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but it, but it does, uh, you know, uh, whenever, uh, whenever I'm in an airport or something and, 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 and a porter or a bus driver comes to you and says, hey! <laughs> like <this. laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and, and, and maybe that same fellow who goes like this, uh, and if he sees me on, uh, on PBS uh, playing a concerto, maybe he'll stay and listen, and maybe someone will go and come to the concert. Uh, uh, in San Francisco, again, there was a couple of people who came uh, to my concert and said, this is the first time I've ever been to a concert. I really enjoyed it. Well, I feel that it may be very, very, uh, very small percentage, but it is, I think, uh, serves an important uh, part in building up audiences and or at least uh, building a different kind of an audience yes 
When you're performing in front of a large number of people, do you try and uh, just wipe from your mind the fact that there are all these people out there? Or do you um, try and uh, take, take what they're giving you and benefit from the fact that you have a large audience in front of you? Well, I'll tell you, what I try and wipe from my mind is the empty seats, if there are any. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I like a large, I'll, I'll, you know, it's so intimate, you know, to have 5,000 people with you. <laughs> so wonderful. No, I like, I like to play for an audience. I feel an audience uh, is, is a very important part of performing. It's, uh, uh, who do you communicate to if there's no, it's the northern audience. And that's why what happens is that in a recording studio, it's, I find it's a real tough time to re readjust because you play for two mics. And those microphones are real, they're great critics, you know, they don't, they hear everything. But uh, an audience I find is a great, great help to me, I like it. Yes? Um, have you ever felt nervous during or um, before a performance, right now? I mean, even though you're a professional, do you yes. still feel nervous? Yes, 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 uh, sometimes. I'm not really nervous, uh, I'm only nervous when I have a memory slip. Oh boy, am I nervous. <laughs> And that's, that's when my real creative powers are at work, you know. <laughs> I write new music. On the spot, I write it. Not always very good. So uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, nervousness they have. But it's not nervous, you know, like shaking, everything like that. I'm going to play it all. This way. Am I going to play? No. No. Oh. Oh. Well, I'll take the fiddle out yeah. if you want it. Yeah. Now, oh my goodness, you want to see my family here? <laughs> okay, let me see what I got here. Oh, got my Yarmul. Oh, no, no, no. No, that's not the fiddle. Oh, here it is. Okay. Anyway, now I can talk with my fiddle in my hand. Now, that'll make everybody more comfortable, huh? right? So, uh, <laughs> wait a minute, there's some... some uh, Wait a minute, over there, yes. Um, well, based on your own experience, do you think that being a good mus musician is kind of a gift, or is it just a lot of practice? I mean, do you find that you can just sit down and just make music because you have a gift? Very good question. Um, I think part of it is true, and I think part of it is not. I think that to be able to understand uh, to be able to play what you feel partially is a gift. To sort of translate what you feel into, into, uh, into this language is partially a gift. Uh, but you also have to be able to know what, what the hell you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, all the gift in the world is not going to help you out. In other words, that your instinct will take over and, and by accident you'll play something very, very well. But you really want to know what you're doing. And uh, obviously, if you have a gift, it helps you do that easier. Okay, uh, I have one last question, and uh, then we have to, to wrap it up, because uh, let me see. Uh... Uh, why is there so little new classical music? Well, there's no more classical music. It's finished. It's now, now it's contemporary music. I mean, uh... <laughs> no more classical. No it's, no, it's finished. In other words, right now, you... Uh, you know, it's what people are writing today, and maybe one day this would be will be called late classical, or uh, or uh, classical of so classical of the '80s. Can you imagine they're listening to the radio and now for hits of the '80s? <laughs> you know, terrific. Uh, no, no, come on. <laughs> but there is definitely uh, now a uh, uh, some good stuff is being written, and uh, you know we're going to see what what's going to last. You know, a lot of the stuff that we consider today great was considered terrible. You know, if you heard the uh, reviews that the Tchaikovsky concerto received, the violin concerto, when it first uh, uh, was performed, uh, the, rev the critic says that the violin is beaten black and blue because uh, it has things like... You know, that, that's beaten black and blue, you know. But but it's all a question of what people were used to listening to at that time. So maybe today all the uh, you know, synthesizers and electronic music and all of that stuff would sound absolutely passé for people in 25 or 30 years from now. You never know. Okay, 
Thank you very, very much. Uh, some of the questions were good, but some were terrific. So, <laughs> so I want to really thank you very, very much for coming here. A feature that, live from Lincoln Center, filmed with Yitzhak Perlman in 1982, repeated now by popular demand. And what Mr. Perlman referred to when he said classical music is finished is in the literal sense, because the literalists call the period of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven the classical period in music. That was followed, of course, by the uh, Romantic period, and then post-Romanticism, and the uh, neoclassical period in the early and uh, middle years of the 20th century. Classical music in the strictest sense, referring to Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and their era. Glenn Dictoro, the concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic, tuning the musicians in the orchestra, prior to the performance that we're about to hear of the Symphony No. 5 in E minor by Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, ever the self-doubter, wrote to his patroness, Madame Nadezhda von Meck, that he felt very little confidence in the symphony upon which he was working, his fifth. Of course, posterity has proven otherwise. It long since has taken its place among the most popular of all symphonies. Zubin Mehta conducts the New York Philharmonic in the Symphony No. 5 in E minor by Tchaikovsky.
Lincoln Center. This has been the Symphony No. 5 in E minor by Tchaikovsky. Zubin Mehta conducting the New York Philharmonic. Our next Live from Lincoln Center telecast will take place on Wednesday evening, November 12. Check the local listings in your area for exact date and time. It will be a performance by the New York City Opera of Leonard Bernstein's Candide. Beverly Sills will host the program, which is in two acts. Scott Bergeson will conduct the New York City Opera Orchestra. And in the cast, Erie Mills, Deborah Dar, Muriel Costa Greenspan, David Eisner, John Langston, Scott Reeve, James Billings, and Jack Harrow. Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony bringing this live from Lincoln Center telecast to a triumphant conclusion. And this, as we have already mentioned, is the gala opening concert of the New York Philharmonic's 1986-1987.